Hi everyone, I'm Annette Heistoffer, the horticulture agent in Davis County. And today, come along with me and let's enjoy our holiday plants and learn about their care. Amaryllis is one of those that is very popular and you see it this time of year. I remember my first amaryllis that I had seen and it was actually at my grandmother's home. It was sitting on a, be a beautiful table outside on a, on a porch that was covered and heated. And the flowers were so big. Those flowers are four to eight inches in width and just pretty amazing to a little girl. The amaryllis genus is the Hippiastrum. It's in the Amaryllidaceae family. Uh, it's native to uh, South America. And in the 1700s, the Dutch bulb growers have had started to make it more popular and to look at it. Of course, today there are many different hybrids available to see what we have and that we grow during this day. Of course, we are in zone six. This is a zone eight to 10 plant. So of course, this is an indoor plant. Flower colors can vary from solid red to a solid white, to a pink and white, to a red and white. And there are even doubles that are beautiful. And you might find a few others as well. For their care, the amaryllis likes to be in, in a pot that is pot bound. So it's okay if there's only about an inch between the bulb and the pot. Blooms in about four to 12 weeks. And the market that is focused on is the Christmas market. So when you have an amaryllis and you are trying to get it to bloom again, it may bloom at different times, just depends on when you started the process of getting it to rebloom. It takes a well-drained potting soil, uh, one that is more uh, to the peat moss, or you might find the coconut core is also what comes with these bulbs. Water when the soil is dry to the touch. Keep up with it a little bit more when it's in flower. That's when it does require more water. With these bulbs, we leave them about one third to one half of the bulb is exposed when it's planted. So as it's beginning to grow, it needs bright indirect light. Turn the pot as it is growing, because if you don't, it'll start leaning to the light. If it doesn't have bright light, it may also get really tall and lanky. So if a stake is needed, you could use a dowel rod. I have seen glass stakes being offered, so it's a little fancier. There's just a different ways that you can stake the flowers. But if you don't, then they start leaning over the pot and they could break off. After it's finished blooming, and of course I don't have a photo of it because what do we want that to look like? So I didn't think about taking that photograph. But after the flowers are done and they bloom, one and two and then three and four, usually you have four, sometimes four, three to four blooms per stalk. And when those are all finished, then we cut them back and get rid of that flower stalk. We need to leave the leaves there to provide energy for next season's flower. Fertilize it every two weeks with a houseplant fertilizer and provide as much light as possible. Sometimes you will have bulbs that will produce two flower stalks and sometimes only one flower stalk. And again, many times there's three to four blooms per stalk. Once we have removed that stalk, we're letting it grow in our house, then we can move it outdoors after the threat of frost is finished, which would be sometime in May, depending on where you live. Uh, take it to a place, I like to put it in bright shade because it has to acclimate to the bright light as well as to possible, if you get into full sun, it could burn the plant right away. Just let it grow, water, proceed to fertilize it, 
and at the end of the summer, start withholding the water. Bring it back indoors after those night temperatures drop down to 50 degrees. Now you can also stop this process of it growing a little bit sooner by bringing it in sooner to try again to get it to bloom at Christmas time rather than into being a plant that comes zone eight to 10, it's not above 50 degrees. To maintain it as the foliage yellow dies, then move it to a cool dry location such as a basement, a closet, uh, someplace in the corner of a, a, a cool room and allow it then to rest or is between 45 and 60 degrees if you have that available. For causing it to rebloom or helping it to rebloom, repot it if it's needed. If the bulb is almost bulging out of the container, then we'll need to repot it. Sometimes there are small bulb bills on the side. That's how it reproduces. You can remove the small small bulblets on the side and then before it begins to bloom. So after it's dormancy, begin to water it, and then the process starts over. In purchasing amaryllis, if you wanted to start some new ones, a bulb, you can get a, purchase it by just a bulb. There are times you can find blooming plants, although I like the bulb so that I can see the process occur. Then it can also be as a decorative wax bulb, which is disposable because the bottom of the bulb, they actually cut out part of the area where the roots come from. And so it will not go ahead and rebloom. So it can be disposable. Now as gardeners, we can try to take it out of that wax and try to see if it'll regrow, but it's mainly is a disposable plant. And then this way you don't have the mess of the water as you're watering it. I always get water over the area. So this way, if you have a nice area you don't want water in, you can use one of these that are waxed. It is a little more expensive, of course. Or you could purchase the amaryllis as a kit. In the kit, it has a bulb, the media to put it in, and a container. And just follow the directions on how to put that kit together. So the amaryllis is just one of those plants it always brings a smile. And if you're like me, I love to watch them and get real excited, which my children don't always understand, but I get real excited when it starts to bloom. Another plant is the uh, Christmas cactus or Thanksgiving cactus. We call it holiday cacti. Many of the plants are the Thanksgiving cactus. There is just a little bit of difference in looking at the actually each individual segment of the stem, but it's so close that we just put them all together in holiday cactus. Many times it is the Thanksgiving cactus that we have. It's native to the jungles of Brazil and actually in trees. So it's an epiphyte up on the branches growing in material that is just gathered on the tree for it to have a place to be. Again, it's a zone 10 to 12, so we know it's tropical and therefore it's not a plant that we can grow outside during our cold season. Colors come in white, yellow, gold, pink, rose, coral, red, purple, and I'm sure there's others that are out there too as we continue to breed them and collect them. And as you can see, the flowers are very unique and it's again a plant that brings a smile to your face when you see it blooming and some excitement as, as we see it about to bloom. I remember my grandmothers uh, and my aunts. Uh, my aunts was just absolutely gorgeous. So these are plants that you remember and bring back great memories. For the care, since they are that epiphyte and growing in the plant debris, they do need peat-based potting soil. It has to be well-drained and because again, it's more of a, a succulent type plant. 
and it will rot if it's too wet. It needs bright indirect light and it prefers day temperature below 75 uh, when we're at the point especially of it blooming in that period. Water when the soil is dry to the touch. Again, we want to avoid it being too wet and as the water accumulates in the dish below or if it's in a pot cover, make sure after you water it, let it drain and then empty the water out of that pot cover or out of the container that the pot is sitting in. I don't know if you've done this before, but I have. I had a plant that I purchased. I saw the buds on it. It was going to be absolutely gorgeous, but then the blooms all fell off. What can happen is sometimes the temperature is above 75 degrees or there was a sudden change in temperature. So possibly from when I purchased it to getting it to my location or where it was growing and in transit to the store is possibly where that temperature change happened. And the buds may also drop off over when it's over watered in a heavier soil. To be able to maintain that holiday cactus from January through May, we are watering it, making sure it's dry. So you may wanna wait a day or two or more depending on the soil type it's put in. Fertilize it each month with a complete houseplant fertilizer. About the 1st of June, you can take it outside to receive six hours of sunlight. Again, remember to acclimate it to the sunlight. We don't want the plant to burn. If it's overcrowded, then that's a great time to repot it as well. The uh, holiday cactus actually blooms in response to short days or to cool temperatures. So for short days, it would expose to nine hours of light and 15 hours of darkness each day starting in September. So that would mean you would need to cover it. But for, for me, I do like the process of just leaving it outside through September and then bringing it indoors in early October. So as we have continued to water it throughout the summer and fertilizing it, at September 1st, we need to reduce some of that water frequency. So we're not getting it uh, too lush of a growth. We're wanting it to go into the reproductive phase. Fertilize every six weeks. Leave the plant outdoors until October 15th. And that's about, at least in, in my area, where we can start getting some of the first frost. So it's not one that will tolerate the frost. Uh, without treatment, if you don't do this, the flowers may produce sporadically. So at times I've had one in my window. I think it gets enough of the cool air underneath it, plus it's in the office so it, the light's not always on. So it does produce and have the, it's in flower now. So that's why sometimes we go through all this work and then why does mine produce with flowers and yours doesn't. So here are some, those were some ideas of what to use to try to get yours to rebloom. And then in November and December, enjoy your flowers. Again, this is one that's fun to share with family. I have one from my grandfather and then from a major professor that I had in college. So something that I'll always remember them by. And again, you can propagate them by twisting off, we kind of call those little pads that each leaf, let it set out for a couple of days to dry and then put it in soil to try to root them. The Norfolk Island pine is actually not a pine at all. It is a subtropical tree from zone 9B to 11. It's native to Norfolk Island and the Pacific Islands where there it reaches 150 to 250 feet in its native setting. And the pine cones are huge uh, for that particular plant. But it's one that we use, of course, as a house plant. When we use it indoors, it needs high humidities because think of where it's from. It's from the South Pacific Islands. It needs a bright window, water it well and let it dry out. 
and keep those decorations light and decorate only with small lights. And you might even find small ornaments that you could put over the in entire plant. At this time of year, you will see these available in stores and some of them are already little decorations. So if you have a location that you're not able to put in a big tree or you haven't had time to get a big tree, you can use these as nice little Christmas trees as well. Repop them as needed. They usually come in as a small nursery pot, maybe a six inch, and then it will grow. Realizing that over time, it could get six to eight feet tall if it really likes your conditions. Uh, bright window, high humidity, and let it dry out in between. And it will tolerate about a 45 to 85 degree temperature. One of these, again, that you commonly see already pre-decorated, so it's a quick, nice gift. One of those plants that is one to look forward to as a tradition in my family is I'm looking for the perfect one for my mother, from my father and I. With, it's in the Euphorbiaceae family, and it was found back in 1825 by Joe Robert Poinsett. So thus the name, common name of poinsettia. Robert Poinsett was a, an ambassador to Mexico at that time and he sent it back to South Carolina. And from there, it was distributed through the United States and then become, has become popularized in the US. It's actually a $170 million crop in the United States. And it's actually one of the most popular pot crops too. In the 1800s, as Joel Robert Poinsett noted, missionaries used it in Mexico and then the nativity processions. It's also been recorded that the Aztecs used it for medicinal purposes and as a dye. It is a zone nine to 11 plant. So anytime you're on the internet and you see poinsettias outside, then you know it's not in Kentucky. Especially if everything is green behind it, um, it wouldn't be Kentucky unless we get a really warm day and it's only brought out a little bit at a time. So it's definitely an indoor plant. The part of the flower that is so colorful are actually bracts, are actually modified leaves. The inside are actually the flowers. When you're purchasing the poinsettia, make sure that those flowers are closed and you don't see the little stamens and pistils sticking out. Otherwise it won't last as long. Colors of the bracts could be anywhere from red, white, punch, pink, cream, rose. Uh, they give them names like Jingle Bell, Marble. Uh, there's a cranberry red. There is actually even a yellow. And I have seen that used at one time at Vatican City many years ago. There's even a purple color too. Poinsettias are not poisonous. They are considered non-edible, of course. Research has shown that this plant is not poisonous. It would take, during that study, they said it would take so many pounds of bracts and leaves that it still didn't make the individual to a point where they would die. We do see this sometimes out in, in the media, but it's not. So as we learn about the poinsettia, we'll keep spreading the word that it's not poisonous. But we do want to keep it out of the way of children and pets. When we purchase it, we need to give it bright sunny location for at least an hour or more of sunlight daily if you can at all possible. Provide adequate water. They can dry out very quickly. Our homes are very dry in the winter time. But yet remember to pour off the excess water out of the container that it's in, uh, also out of the pot cover. Fertilize it once a month with an all-purpose fertilizer for, for house plants. And we want to keep it above 50 degrees. So sometimes we might have a sun sunroom or and that should be pretty good because it'd be nice and bright. But if we have an auxiliary porch and it doesn't, it's not heated, don't forget the poinsettia, it needs to be 
brought back in the house. So keep it above 50 degrees. Many times I love to enjoy my poinsettia. This is probably one of the popular plants that I'm, I don't keep because I'm usually tired of it, but I have had master gardeners enjoy getting it to rebloom. So it's a challenge. So if you're going to get it to rebloom in March, about March 17th, prune it to about three to six inches to remove the colored bracts at that time. Sometimes they do keep the bracts that long. About May 10th, we're trimming it to two to six inches again to promote side branches. Put it in a larger container if it needs to be. And you can move it outside. And you can put it in direct sunlight or if you actually have a spot that would have bright light, very bright light, that would probably work as well. That June, July period, we're fertilizing about every two weeks, water regularly. And you see that we're talking about trimming because this is a plant that will really grow for us. August through October, we're fertilizing it now every week. And in early September, we're pruning it to about 18 to 24 inches tall unless you really want a big plant with a lot of little quote unquote blooms. So when you want to, to rebloom it, bring it indoors and try it again to get as much sunlight as possible. On that September 21st or about October 1st, you want to give it 14 hours of uninterrupted darkness and 10 hours of bright sunlight. So it means being put in the closet, taken in and out. And if there's any light in between that period of time, it can keep it from having the bracts turn color. As far as these, these times, with our breeding of poinsettias, some poinsettias take all of that time to be able to trigger turning the bracts color, but some may color a lot faster so it doesn't take as many weeks. So this is a little bit of an experimental pro process on your part. After October 31st, keep the plant in a sunny area and reduce the fertilizer. And then we're gonna fertilize about every three weeks we don't want to get it actively growing. We just want it to be maintained and then enjoy your poinsettia. I find it very interesting, the history of the poinsettia. Dr. Jim Faust is actually uh, a classmate of mine from my undergraduate days. And this is a great video. It surprised me to see the wild species that actually was collected and what we see today through all of the breeding. He actually goes to uh, Mexico and finds the wild species and participates in breeding of the poinsettia. Keep the plants away from heat sources to make all of these holiday plants last longer. Keep them away from cold drafts. So when you open the door to outside, that an area next to that door would not be a good idea. And flowers also last longer if the temperatures are cooler. So a cooler room would be a suggestion when they're in that flowering stage. I hope you've enjoyed our tour today of some of the popular holiday plants that we have. These are definitely some that in our memories of our family members and friends, and they're just fun to enjoy through this holiday season.